Hello, SG Davis will be part two in, um, didn't expect it to be, I'm going to do a series on the Aswan quarry being it so prominent amongst a mysterious lost sort of high technology um, area, which again sort of relies on this, that it's, these things aren't studied and it's unexplained and the Egyptologists are all covering this type of thing up. Uh, basically type into Google or Google Scholar, uh, Aswan quarry PDF, uh, Aswan quarry marks PDF, you'll get a plethora of sources um, in regards to this, but most recognizable by the unfinished obelisk. And instead, I think it's really important um, to look at still images and I'm going to be using, is it a project? You'd call them an alternative source, but they do great documentation. So whether it's a therapy, you, you name the place, look up, is it, a, is it a project? The place that you're looking up in Egypt and they'll have a great catalogue of photos and videos. But I think the still images are best because we want to look at details now. Here's another part of the quarry. Now, this has been important because whether then or now, if you want to get a big block of stone, uh, you don't necessarily have to cut it out because the quarry choose a site and there'll be large blocks ready to go. But uh, this video, I want to have a look at the test pits, but there's a few other little things to point out. So here we see is what is believed to be the ancient harbour. Now, for instance, you can see the water down here. Now that trench has been filled in, but there has been excavation there. Uh, it was basically a canal system which linked the, this part of the quarry directly to the river. So they didn't have to even take it the distance to the river you could just basically load the stones here in this harbour but the harbour itself or this part that's being quarried out uh, would, would have been a source of stone so if you're going to carve something out you want to well use source the stones there as well so you know two uh, birds with one stone so to speak but uh, there's a couple of different views now also notice here you can see pictures of ostriches I'll link a bunch of uh, papers in the description which go into this and other details which include uh, actual inscriptions from there from the dynastic period which describes uh, all including deta you know, uh, details of the work there not just pretty pictures of animals uh, ostriches or fish or boats etc now, there is uh, evidence there and it's not covered up and it has been studied now there's also now for instance see you might see it along here and along here well you can see that these removal marks have been made now i'll explain so uh part one i was look, looking at the dolerite seam so the, you'll often hear lol copper chisels lol dolerite pounders um and well where did the stone come from well the stone is sourced there but this dike or seam of dolerite also as i showed in part one follows the workings of the quarry so you would take an advantage of the cracks that are in there now some cracks will be obvious but you can only see them on the top you don't know if the crack turns a few feet down the crack might turn away so what you want to do if you want to for instance take a block well that block of granite is already sourced for you because you have the dolerite and you already have it again the natural crack there so a lot of the work's done for you if you do it um, with a little bit of planning and a little bit of intelligence and that has to do with the uh, the test pits as well and we'll look at that now here's uh, I'll link I'll link it in part one but um, canal extension confirmed and so you can see the black and white photos there and just to show you now we can see sometimes it's dry and sometimes it's uh, filled up now you can see there it's dry at the moment but we can use this we can see there but so that's what we're looking at but the point will be test pits now here's a, a view of one of the test pits and notice the stone eating scarab so lost ancient high biotech technology confirmed you notice that the stone eating scarab also dropped some poo out there anyway that's no, just a backpack but <laughs> all right so but uh, here's a test pit you might notice a detail in there that sticks right out there's another test pit. It's an important detail right there that would stick out. Here's another test pit. Here's a view of another one. And here we see 
one of the more interesting ones now they they're hanging down so this, that's a camera they're hanging it down is it a project they got the photos in there to, just to get a view of this test pit because it it twists and it turns and well i think that the the clues for that are right there to be seen in the photo we'll examine that first but uh, there's the unfinished obelisk and there are two test pits right next to it i'll link the paper uh there this is one of the images from there now what's interesting is that in this test pit in dynastic egyptian writing there are, is a marker the first month of shamu or uh shamu was the season of harvest so during the flood season there was a lot of free labor because everything was flooded so but during this season of shamu the or shimu i'm not sure of the pronunciation their labor would be needed so again this would indicate that work was going on all year round and of course so you know they had craftsmen and you know not everyone needed to work in it they were a sophisticated organized civilization again they weren't uh, primitive loincloth wearing people they were very smart that they had taxes and bureaucracy and all this type of thing so again this is one of the tropes that just gets repeated of oh, a dynastic you know the loincloth wearing primitives no uh, no not at all but we also see the marking so first month of summer third month of the same month fourth month and and these marks you can see there are almost at the same height now this level so we also see one meter okay that's the marks of a quarry workers unfinished obelisk quarry Aswan Egypt preliminary report that's the source of that picture again I'll be linked in the description and we also have one meter now so basically over three and a third months that was the amount of digging that was done into the granite now that's consistent with experiments that have been done with stone pounders Again, don't let it, you'll see I get it in you'll see it in all sorts of comments that it would take eons and it would take forever no experiments have been done uh, documented ones as well and they can be repeated they had no problem removing a large amount of stone the only experiment undocumented which uh, is from Christopher Dunn for some for some reason whenever you're a lost high technologist you, you know you you can't remove a granite core with a copper tool you you cannot use a dollarite pounder which is exactly the same as a metal tool as well metal would be steel would be more efficient but it's not much difference at all but it just there's always yeah they always fail their way into success towards the it can't be done with dynastic tools no it can be done again it can be tested and i just would dare any of them to repeat the experiment and document it and i want to do another video on that because there's a lot of chicanery in regards to that as well and they've been caught out but anyway the test pits the unfinished obelisk there's and it it's, has the markings it has the writings in there the level of work is consistent with the experiments that have been done if anything uh they're going at a slow rate and i'll insert the clip if not here but somewhere along this video because not just they weren't just using copper chisels and dollarite pounders they had a whole toolkit available to them which uh, includes uh, wedges but also more importantly the use of fire granite is weak against fire yeah you can even look up uh, firefighters um, after plastic and wood granite is the worst material in regards to fire if a granite building gets on fire it's basically ruined sandstone and limestone much more fire resistant granite is just folds like a wet paper bag before fire and so a combination of tools would would come in play now uh so anyway test pits there's the one we have writings in there the other papers linked where we've literally got the you know they've documented there on the walls other quarries have got lovely pictures and descriptions and inscriptions and it's um written in there so anyway now here we have a uh, picture now notice also the shape of this particular test bit i'm not sure if this is the one referenced here 
But again, the, the shape of them is important because they tend to follow this type of shape where it's flat on one side and circular on the other. So we get the meter, so it's very thin. Um, so, okay, well, the question is, well, how did they dig down? Because I'll show the picture of a guy crouching on the ground and doing a dolerite, uh, pounding with dolerite. Well, I would, so, you know, I think that's an easy problem to solve. I would stand up and, you know, just tie some string on and have, and, and just bang, bang, bang. Uh, not too different to a lot of uh, tools that were used uh, re recently in quarries um, to dig straight down as well. So, and child labour laws weren't a problem as well. Now, a slim man could get down there, or a teenager, or even a child. And not only, so again, remember that you wouldn't use a, this, probably the picture doesn't show, but there are sharp edges all around this stone. That's a piece of uh, grano diorite that I've got which works great on red granite as well, um, other ones. Um, but there are, solu you know, there are solutions to these, and sticks and strings is m more often than not the, the first and easiest solution to these problems. Um, yeah, don't, don't downplay our ancients and, and don't downplay the fact that simple tools work great. Uh, in some cases, you would say they're better because they, they're so simple to make, maintain, and do a new one. Now, uh, steel is better, but still, we have a whole industry and infrastructure behind that. So when it comes to these type of tools, don't just think about the tool. Think about the amount of work and energy that would go into mining it, ref, uh, smelting, refining, and all the work that goes along with these type of things as well. Uh, Simple's good, simple works uh, works great as well, and it's not a huge difference. Now, there's another uh, point I want to make here, because in the first video I mentioned it, and then I found, again, Adele Kalani, um, done a lot of work in regards to quarrying, um, along with Per Stormmeyer and some other people as well. But in this paper, he points out exactly what I was suggesting in the last video, uh, so there's the abstract, but this study refutes two popular misconceptions about the dolerite pounders. First, the desired form of these tools were not the well-rounded, nearly spherical balls now commonly seen in the ancient quarries and construction sites. Evidence from a dolor dolerite quarry discovered by the authors in Aswan indicates that the pounders were initially angular, compact and irregular to sub-rectangular in form. So basically like that stone I'm showing you there, it's got sharp edges on it. Um, progressive rounding during the use eventually reduced them to a nearly spherical shape by which point they had lost mo much of their effectiveness and were so discarded. So all those dollarite balls that you've uh, pounded, you, they're old tools. They're, get rid of them. What you want is bring in sharp, angular tools. Uh, there's another paper in regards to that. So here we can see at the um, Gebel El Granite uh, Metadolorite Quarry. These tools were brought in, and here we see a picture. Uh, I think this might be from Aswan, but again, all these old quarry sites have these type. That's your used tool, and that's your original tool. Now, as a okay, so when you're working, you don't use a ball hammer when you're working with stone. You would use a pick such as this. So these type of stones have that sharp wedge shape that would be much more efficient than uh, pounding with either a, a dull flat end or a rounded end. So that's basically the difference between these type of tools. New and used, uh, that was what I said, so just with, I don't have dollar right, but I was using black flint and at first I was using this rounded tool and pounding and well, it's effective, uh, slower, but then I a, a piece broke off and I just noted that this, these sharp angular, because they're nice and sharp and they're really cutting into the stone. And plus there's an added benefit. So all, as all the little flakes fall off, then you hammer the little flakes into the stone and they act like sort of micro chisels as well and make it much faster. So it's not just, even the ball pounders are not a bad tool. You can get even better by using, well, tools such as these, which are <clears throat> sharper corners 
and so uh, scientists against Smith videotaped it to show their experiment. Uh, other Egyptologists have reported on them, and their work rates are all very similar. They, but uh, Chris Dunn is the outlier. He's for some reason is much slower than everyone else's. But um, they were using a rounded dolerite pounder. So even that working rate, which they showed, which is not terrible. Um, could be increased and so I've had a, a few people sort of comment uh, oh geez, now uh, for, now for, I have I live Sydney's this giant sandstone basin after travel a far way away if you live and want to you know uh, to make a video and to you know uh, get some flint or some maybe some grano diorite which is sharp corners and you know for half an hour or, or an hour bang away at the granite and then you can see what what the work rate is uh, with these so compare the rounder tool to the sharper tool that will be flaking and breaking off and providing again little sort of micro chisels as you bang um, into the stone so again the, the rounded ones not so they're not again I'd rather an, a nice steel pick but they work all right and for further experimentation again to speed up the process uh, even more that type of tool I'll link that, okay. But back to the uh, test bits and what's happening here. Um, okay, now we just want to go back here because if, if you're working at a quarry, just, you know, there's not just like a hundred kilometers of a single piece of granite that that's, has no cracks in it. That's just not the way things tend to work. And so, you look closely now I'll just show so what you have in these quarries is all these cracks running through now that crack is a cut that doesn't have to be either pounded out or or cut to pieces now I'll, I'll show again later now for instance at the uh, Cafre Valley Temple where you have these uh, large slabs well there's a crack running there and you can sort of see make out the shape so there'd be a nice um, slab to be quite easily removed. Well, they have been removed and you can see the traces of the follow the crack line. You can also see the traces of the work that's been done there. But if you, you take advantage of, of these cracks and so that, that, there's a whole bunch of blocks ready to go. So you have a rough block ready to go and then you would get into the, the dressing work. So, but let's start with removing, which is really the, the, the tough part, would be removing the large blocks. And, well, the, don't fight against nature, fight with nature. That's going to do your work for you. Uh, now, there's just a close up of those um, grooves there that have been cut out. Again, just follow the lines. Again, you can see the lines there. There's those uh, ostriches in there. Which again points especially back into the Old Kingdom period, um, especially around about the time of Unus, there was a environmental catastrophe with flood, uh, drought, extended drought. But you know, you see the old Egyptian imagery: crocodiles, hippos, ostriches. Now we think of them more as southern Africa or central, but the animals we more connect with the savanna and that type of thing. Uh, hippos, yeah, crocodiles. They were. In, especially in upper or southern or upper Egypt um, you can even see the drawings there of them so it was, the world was a little bit different there it was a lot more uh, water and even the flood level would have been higher which would make moving these stones much much simpler but okay now let's look at this test pit so there we see the test pit again notice there's a natural crack running here and you can see the crack running along there take advantage of this and look, they did as you can you can see it in the quarry but they took advantage of it and you can even see a horizontal crack um, running there as well now this will just make it so easy to work the stone now because i mean there's a you know, before, now it's gone but you can see there was a block there you know this sheer face well, you remove a stone away and if you've got a horizontal and a vertical crack once you've the tough part would be making the shelf 
to begin with, but then once you've done that, you can now take advantage, plan your quarrying along these cracks to, and you, once it's set up, the quarry is then pumping stuff out. Uh, here's an example of basically the same principle that was used in you know quarrying as well. You can see the sort of seam and and uh, so again breaking off larger blocks. Uh, I think this one, this old picture, they've they've used a uh, wire saw maybe to cut that already. But um, just as an ex just to show the principle that you know whether it's a crack or whether you've whether that was a cut by the quarryman or whether it was ex exposing a using a natural crack well it's just we've saved a lot of time and then the tendons uh granite will break very not nicely along uh it, it's just a lovely stone in that way and uh, if you look up mike haddock as well he's done some you know he's a uh his brothers worked in quarries and they talk about this more in, in and show demonstrations in detail uh granite will crack where you tell it to um now there's always going to be faults in the stone, but the majority of the time there won't be because you've sounded. Now another technique would, uh, that masons and quarrymen still use is basically to walk around with a with a hammer, whether it's metal or with and bang, 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 and they can hear the cracks in there. But that's what the test pits come from. Now, okay, now this test pit and this well this is being cleared away. Well, you can see that the test pit was already there before okay but now it continues down okay so just to highlight it all right now let's look at i oh know let's go back to these test pit pictures now what's happening here well there's a crack there and notice that what are they doing with these test pits they're testing you know and that's why you know it's they're looking for the crack if you want to start carving out especially like a big block like the unfinished obelisk you don't want to get 90 percent of the way down and then find that there is these vertical and horizontal cracks appearing so you test it first here's another picture from the same angle but again just again you can see where that crack is now again notice the shape of it where it's we tends to be a, flat surface so that's below the red line is the stone you want to keep and you use the crack that's already there you don't have to go to all the added work of doing it with copper wedges uh, you can split this open as well because it's it's already cracked and you can see again that shape so now uh, even at the bottom you can see these well, scoop marks or these holes consistent with a pounding tool so back to that earlier picture someone's standing up you don't have to be kneeling down we just tie some string around your you know, and, and pound it that way uh, fire setting would be another uh, way to do it now you don't need a you, you need a campfire burning for a very short time um, again if I haven't played the clip yet I'll play the clip now in that experiment they do at Aswan quarry they let the fire burn for uh, roughly an hour um, I'll put the playlist of the experiments that I did um, 10 to 15 minutes would be enough and you don't even need to like burn a big fire you just need to have your fire elsewhere and then drop your coals down there that heats up the stone then you drop the water on there thermal shock the sudden the expansion and then subtle sudden contraction sends micro cracks through there at which point the pounding process can be greatly accelerated again with fire you can just chew through granite uh, no problem now Okay, where we just see that picture again, but again, just uh, you know, following the cracks, and notice as a crack goes down, well, then they change the direction, and then you can see that the test pit has moved off. Well, they're releasing the crack and they're following the crack, and uh, now the next, so when the next stage of quarrying comes along, they know where the cracks are, and we can just open up a new shelf, and once you get that difficult, tight, you know, hard work of the first stage going. Now that you know where these cracks are, horizontal and vertical ones, you can just knock these blocks, will just be coming off the production line like nothing. Uh, here's another test pit. What do we see again? They're using a. They're, let's take advantage of what nature has provided for us. Here's another one. Again, you can see the vertical crack, 
and then they split off into other ones. Now you can also sort of see now use to take advantage again take advantage of these and so it's not just about extracting unfinished obel obelisk size boxes it's also about um, blocks it's also about those such as in the Osiron or at the Khafre Valley Valley Temple and those either the walls or the pillars and um, lintels that they use there well why go to all the effort if you can map out your quarry dig some test pits and then release so again this is a really cool picture because it's i'm not sure whether well once you have a test pit and you know where the cracks are well then you follow them along so you see put them on. now they have so much of the work is already done then you can use a plug and feather technique again i've uh in the playlist i i had one millimeter thick sh uh, shims of copper and i used wooden wedges to uh split things out so you, you don't need steel wedges you don't um you, wood and copper will work especially where the cracks already made all right so that's yeah. once you know where your cracks are horizontal or vertical then you start doing your trench so here we see another test pit now they've gone down and they've tested and they've found this one i couldn't see you know there's no uh cracks there so you wouldn't just be doing your test pit where the cracks already are now if you want a nice big block of granite um such as the unfinished obelisk and we'll show that in a moment but once you've got a test pit you know where your cracks are or where they are not then you can start your diffi the difficult stage of trenching them out. And once they're trenched, then again, it's really easy to start removing blocks uh, with splitting techniques. But okay, now, so for instance, we see the unfinished obelisk here, and just about the whole point of this video. So, I mean, this joint is. You know, there's um crack city <laughs> you know it's so yeah, it's uh and now notice also these cracks in here i think one of the reasons uh originally i thought maybe it was a because there's this big crack there along there that there was a fire setting incident or something but i think one of the reasons it was unfinished was because it was really bad planning um and whoever was the foreman i'm i'm guessing he he got uh, copped an earful now these might have appeared later but again you can sort of just see that this particular spot is overloaded with all sorts of horizontal vertical uh diagonal types of cracks i'm not even highlighting that there's just some of the ones in there so that could be uh, one of the reasons because it was just um well yeah cracked it all cracked up but all right so that's the so those test pits it's using um, pounding stones it can be done in a reasonable time but some of those test pits have dates on them showing the, the progression of the work and by using fire setting and not rounded dolerite pounders but the sharp angular ones much much faster than than what is also sort of seen there and so uh we sort of see so now we're looking we've extracted rough blocks and and i'll each stage in the this sort of series i'll look at the the next stage in production so once you have a rough block then you want to start getting it uh, reasonably dressed before you send it off to site you want to remove as much stone as you can at the quarry because that means that's a lot less weight to travel and to move about uh and to get to site later so do your work at the quarry as much as you can and save energy for the transportation but next we'll be dressing and so next video i'll have a look at the uh scoop and and grinding marks in there and uh, this is a question i often often get and so we'll look at those next now it's also worth noting here you can see the uh a crack has uh, appeared there so a lot of this pounding work if they had you know, that crack probably appeared because of all of the pounding forced open this micro crack um, in here and so again a lot of that work you know needn't have been done if i were able to detect that crack um, earlier 
or were a few reasons that they could have that could appear as well including the use of fire setting um, to do this you, know, you, you just light a nice fire on there and even a copper tool once it's fire set it, the, the granite just crumbles um, at that point okay but so next we'll look at the, the horizontal uh, long sort of scoopies marks and the sorry vertical scoopy marks and you see that these sort of more well these scoop marks always tend to be on on the horizontal and you'll see that in other quarries as well i will look at some of those and i'll, I'll show that in the next video because the zeta project went to some of the quartzite quarries on the other other bank of the nile from um aswan where they get their quartzite from and you see the same marks in there including inscriptions that go up to uh middle and new kingdom as well so who's this I, I can't date the unfinished obelisk i'll have a look around more if there's been some inscriptions in regards to that there's so much published work that has been done um in regards to this that i almost because uh, i heard these sort of a lost high tech like they, they, they repeat this like it's covered up and they people aren't looking at it and they say it so often and with such confidence that i i start you know well you wouldn't who you know who's gonna you wouldn't say something so foolish as that you'll look a fool you know but my god you it, uh, either they haven't looked or they have looked and they want you to and they just reinforce this this narrative uh onto you there is a lot of work that has been done lot of experiments uh that have been done and if you don't look you won't find and so this will be next now i think there are some well that, yeah okay that's for the next one and we'll go through so these type of scoop marks that's now you're starting to dress the stone you've got a rough block but now you want to shape it into something and well these marks the known tools at the time uh the work again they'll say all it yeah you could do it but it would take eons or thousands of years or you'd be there for hundreds of years no uh again i did the plate um grinding or drilling same with drilling cutting grinding they'll just keep showing one clip of dennis stocks done 20 years ago 30 years ago now uh, they won't show the updated works and they'll never show you the more recent um experiments whether the cutting grinding rates um they're much far you know they're not as good as modern tools but they're not that far off either okay so that's the next part we'll be looking at uh, scoop marks and these grinding marks but removing large stones to get the rough stones ready really uh the other test pits would take you know several months for a good part of a year to get the test pits open but once they're open once they've got them you know what's underground and you can now follow the cracks get two test pits at a certain distance from each other you can map out the cracks and then you can start cutting your trench um, between them and so you're not again wasting time um, on doing work that you know it's not going to be profitable in the end so yeah there's a uh, don't be intimidated by granite. That's one of the things that also, also when I first started, it's like because oh, gran granite, it's like vibranium. You know, it's an indestructible. Like how, oh, but this guy said, look, he says it so confidently. He's such a great orator, but oh, it's important. No one's looking at. No one's done this. No one's. Well, it's, it's just not uh, true. And th the strength of granite is also its weakness. And they did know it. In, and uh, again, yeah, it's a lot more um information is available and the academics uh you know well, why haven't the academic why haven't people built um reconstructed this or well, even if you're to d forget for a moment the ancient tools you want to make a giant granite statue well they still are making them now but even if you just get uh stone carvers with steel tools you know how expensive that is you know and then so it's in this oh well you must replicate 
Uh, take no, you know. I mean, if you're interested, I mean, if generally if you're interested, experiments such as these should be exactly what the ancient lost high technologist people uh, would be doing. And doc, you know, doc, if you if you are like seriously curious about that, they should have been doing these over the last uh, decade, two decades, uh, three decades. That, for instance, Christopher Dunn and and uh, lost high technology precision again it's not precise not even close to what, what they say that that whenever you hear precision symmetry no it isn't um and they've seen them a hundred like I, I i can't register how they they look at the schist disc and still say it's a precise symmetrical like it's a dog's breakfast uh the vases well these are precise well no but look you can see that the drill holes are off center the handles are off center the um neck is off center and anyway so but for those genuinely interested you know, i mean the the mainstream academics are, you, you, they, they, you don't get rich being an archaeologist uh it, this takes money and time and so even just to get a small crew of 10 people for three months to firstly to train them up and get them to a level where they're comfortable with those tools and then to start doing the work and sourcing it and the, the now workplace safety and all these other things now you know child labor back in the day and they didn't have safety boots okay you, you just can't get away with that now so modern recreations have to take into account um all these things very expensive before the in the eighth the king could just say well that's i own that quarry you can take whatever i you know whatever you want you take it i'm the king i can raise armies of thousands of people so, you know, take 500 men and go off and you know, do the work that needs to be done. I want my box, I want my statue, I want my obelisk, get it done. Well, yeah, so for those who are sceptical of, of that type of experiment, well, maybe you should conduct your own. It's, you know, why is it the labour of others? You know, you, you demand the labour of others. And then when we provide it for you then you uh all of the big lost high technology channels are still not covering the experiments that has been done on um, my own or the scientists against smiths or the the other papers and work that's being done martin odler uh, and look it's all out there and they are covering it up they know about it they are covering it up they hide they block uh shadow ban and delete while they're accusing of everyone else of you know the other side of uh of ignoring it or not doing the work and then what then you do something and then you go oh well now now you have to make me an obelisk or you have to make me a, a a sarcophagus like i can just pull up a small army of, of people and feed them and clothe them and get them all uh, accommodation and all the things that go with it Anyway, that's off on a side rant, but it's a relevant one because that's what you'll see in the in the comments. Oh, but you must do this, and well, uh, that's a two-way street. They must also contribute something to this, but that's going to ruin the the business model. So they can just say, well, the te oh my god, the test pits. How do you explain that the test pits? Oh, it's just a, it's a it's an unbridled mystery. It's an unbridled. Come on my tour for six thousand dollars. You know, like on my tour. You know, we uh, yeah. Well, all right. So maybe if they sort of did less talky talky and moving the camera around and looked at details such as these, uh, you know, uh, their audience and their customers would be you know. Um, it's one thing to ask questions, but. Uh, it's another thing to not look for answers or in some cases hide the answers because it ruins the business model but yeah so is it a project i'll link some other papers um in there as well just for further reading because there are a lot of other little smaller details in regarding to dates and inscriptions and that type of thing um in there and yeah so part two Uh, that's it you know a lot of it's yeah it's not it's nowhere near as mysterious or as uninvestigated or uh, as I'll make it out to believe and um, they've got a you know they have a responsibility to, to, to do some research I have a responsibility to look for the counter arguments 
and they have a responsibility as well to do some experimentation rather than cover it up or misrepresent it and, and not link it not even mention the names of the channels that are doing them not just mine but uh, other people and, and just to show the same old Dennis Stocks drilling experiment which again they don't go into the details of it so I want to do some granite cutting um, videos and the rates in regards to that because they again it's always well, it'll take too long to grind it will take too long to polish it will take too long to pound no it doesn't not not at all um, how would that, how would you know if you've never done it and how do your audience know if you don't show the experiments that have been done so whether it's Brian Foster, uh, Uncharted X, Bright Insight, uh, Johanna James, and oh, um, Megalith Maiden, Megalith Mania. Uh, go to their channels, look at where they're going on their tours, follow through, and there's, there's basically one company that you can trace all these tours that come back to, and that's to, to Mr. Iowan as well, which is... Uh, misinformation central in regards to so much of this calls himself a he's not a stonemason he, the things he says are just uh wrong not theoretically wrong demonstrably wrong and uh if again if he, if they or he were genuinely interested they would have done at least a couple of hours of work in regards to this but no they just point at stone and say it's not so uh links keywords and all that in the description uh, we're all in this, you know, if you want to learn, you know, if you want to have an experiment, like um, whether it's Dennis Stocks or Scientists Against Myth, uh, Martin Odler, um, Adele Kalani, myself, who, I mean, the weight of the world is not on our shoulders. So for those, you know, who have a genuine interest, try it out, have a go, add to the collective knowledge and, and experience and information that's out there. It's life's not a spectator sport. Have a good one.